In 1860, a young Russian chemist, Dmitry Ivanovich Mendeleev, argued that elements must be bound by some kind of uniting factor. He determined that the atoms making up different forms of matter had to be similar, and that they could be classified by their atomic weights. Mendeleev carried his ideas out. He classified the 63 chemical elements known at that time according to their various properties. And this was the result. The periodic table. Hydrogen, lithium, beryllium. Mendeleev was so confident of his hypothesis that he left empty spaces for the unknown elements that in theory would be discovered later. His theory was not accepted by many of his scientific colleagues, but as he predicted, the missing elements he knew must exist were soon discovered, gallium, scandium, and germanium. The periodic table was accurate. It constituted clear evidence that nature was structured in a specific order. Mendeleev's periodic table also suggested that atoms were not indivisible, a prevailing tenet at that time. In 1897, John Thomson, the director of the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, found the first subatomic particle. He called it an electron. In 1920, Ernest Rutherford, Thomson's protege, found the proton. And in 1932, James Chadwick, a physicist on Rutherford's team, conclusively proved the existence of the neutron. Rutherford himself designed an atomic model that is the foundation for today's conclusive model, a nucleus made up of protons and neutrons and several orbiting electrons, something very much like a minute solar system. Classical physics could not explain atomic and subatomic particle behavior. Newton based his laws on interactions involving celestial bodies. But those premises fail to apply at an atomic level. Electrons, protons, and neutrons do not behave like a falling apple or a planet in orbit. Something was amiss. And this was the reason quantum mechanics came into being. This is a complex, imaginative, and quite ingenious theory that explains the curious behavior of atomic particles. Quantum mechanics shook classical physics to the roots, and philosophical thinking in general. One of its most revolutionary postulates was the so-called uncertainty principle, put forward in 1927 by the German Nobel Prize winner, Werner Karl Heisenberg. The uncertainty principle held that there existed specific quantum mechanics properties that distinguished atomic behavior from Newtonian physics. It was an intriguing idea. The simple observation of a phenomenon invariably altered the nature of the subject under observation. Heisenberg discovered that it was impossible to measure two properties of the same particle at the same time. He found that an observer might be able to determine, say, the exact location of an electron in space, or its speed, or its trajectory, what physicists call momentum. But it is not possible to determine two or more of these coordinates simultaneously. Any attempt to do so is doomed to failure. The seemingly endless discovery of new particles, however, brings into question the established atomic model. Today, we know that there are more than 200 subatomic particles. How can such complexity be ordered? Is it possible to explain electron dynamics and planetary dynamics with a single theory?
Subatomic particles are obviously very small. So small, in fact, that they cannot be seen even by the most powerful microscopes. They are the tiniest objects known to man. High energy physics relies on various different procedures to observe and manipulate subatomic particles. One of the most efficient of these involves high speed collisions. This takes place in machines like this one, in particle accelerators. Basically, a particle accelerator is a vacuum tube surrounded by electromagnetic devices. Theoretically, it's simple enough. Imagine a proton moving through a tube at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Upon impact with another kind of matter, energy is released as heat. Imagine temperatures as high as 10 billion degrees Celsius. Under such conditions, energy changes into matter, but not just any kind of matter. It's transformed into new particles with very specific properties. The precise moment of impact is recorded by the accelerator's instruments, and so we obtain precious information on the released particles, the paths they take, and their total amount of energy. We want to know what the smallest objects are, and if we can understand the smallest objects and how their behavior is with them, then we can build up from that the more uh, larger objects that we see and touch and smell in our world. We want to be able to have a basis of explanation for the world in which we live. And we know that, uh, that we are made of complex molecules called DNA, very complex molecules. Those molecules are made of atoms, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, all of the important chemical elements that make these vast molecules. We then look at the elements themselves and we look inside and we see their structure. They have a tiny nucleus and clouds of electrons around them. Those are atoms. Uh, we look at the atoms and we say, what are atoms made of? We're going down in space, down in hopefully simplicity. We look at the nucleus of these atoms. They're made of particles called neutrons and protons. And each phase, each stage of this, from molecules to atoms to nuclei, we use particle accelerators as powerful microscopes to allow us to determine the properties of these objects that are so small that it takes a million atoms to cover the size of the period at the end of a sentence in a newspaper article. In the 1950s and 60s, scientists were able to work with increasingly more powerful accelerators. New particles were discovered almost daily. Muons, pions, neutrinos, sigmas. The simple pattern of matter conceived in the 1930s suddenly exploded into something much more difficult to grasp, or so it seemed. In the early 60s, American physicist Murray Gell-Mann, who would be awarded the Nobel Prize in 1969, attempted to simplify the situation. He concluded that the particles making up the nucleus of atoms were not elementary particles, but must be made up of other smaller particles. He called them quarks. No one had ever seen a quark, but there were reasons to believe that they were out there somewhere. Starting with the quark, Gelman and a number of his colleagues designed what physicists know as the standard model for particles and forces, a simple yet elegant attempt to explain matter and its interactions. <laughs> 